Chapter Sixteen of the Count's Millions by Emile Gaboriau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sixteen. It is a terrible task to break suddenly with one's past without even having had time for preparation, to renounce the life one has so far lived, to return to the starting point and begin existence anew, to abandon everything, the position one has gained, the work one has become familiar with every fondly cherished hope and friend and habit to forsake the known to plunge into the unknown to leave the certain for the uncertain and desert light for darkness to cast one's identity aside assume a strange individuality become a living lie change name position face and clothes in one phrase to cease to be one's self in order to become someone else this is indeed a terrible ordeal and requires an amount of resolution and energy which few human beings possess the boldest hesitate before such a sacrifice and many a man has surrendered himself to justice rather than to resort to this last extremity and yet this was what pascal ferrailleur had the courage to do on the morrow of the shameful conspiracy that had deprived him of his good name when his mother's exhortations and baron trigaud's encouraging words had restored his wonted clearness of perception the only course he felt disposed to pursue was to disappear and fly from the storm of slander and contempt and then in a secure hiding-place to watch for the time and opportunity of rehabilitation and revenge madame ferrailleur and her son made all needful arrangements i shall start out at once said pascal and before two hours have elapsed i shall have found a modest lodging where we must conceal ourselves for the present i know a locality that will suit us and where no one will certainly ever think of looking for us and i asked madame ferrailleur what shall i do in the meantime you mother you must at once sell all that we possess here everything even my books you will only keep such of our linen and clothes as you can pack in three or four trunks we are undoubtedly watched and so it is of the utmost importance that every one should imagine i have left paris and that you are going to join me and when everything is sold and my trunks are ready then mother you must send some one for a cab and order the driver to take you to the western railway station where you will have the trunks removed from the cab and placed in the baggage room as if you did not intend to leave paris till the next day very good i will do so even if any one is watching us he won't be likely to suspect this ruse but afterward afterward mother you must go to the waiting-room upstairs and you will find me there i will then take you to the rooms i shall have rented and to-morrow will send a messenger with the receipt the railway people will give you to fetch our luggage for us madame ferrailleur approved of this plan deeming herself fortunate in this great calamity that despair had not destroyed her son's energy and resources of mind shall we retain our name pascal oh no that would be an unpardonable imprudence what name shall we take then i must know for they may ask me at the station he reflected for a moment and then said we'll take your maiden name mother it will bring us good luck our new lodgings will be hired in the name of the widow montmejean they talked for some time longer anxious to take every precaution that prudence could suggest and when they were convinced that they had forgotten nothing madame ferrailleur suggested that pascal should start off but before doing so he had a sacred duty to perform i must warn marguerite he muttered and seating himself at his desk he wrote his beloved a concise and exact account of the events which had taken place he told her of the course he intended to pursue and promised her that she should know his new abode as soon as he knew it himself in conclusion he entreated her to grant him an interview in which he could give her the full particulars of the affair and acquaint her with his hopes as for exculpating himself even by so much as a single word as for explaining the snare he had been the victim of the idea never once occurred to him he was worthy of mademoiselle marguerite he knew that not a doubt would disturb the perfect faith she had in his honour leaning over her son's shoulder madame ferrailleur read what he had written do you intend to trust this letter to the post she inquired are you sure perfectly sure that it will reach mademoiselle marguerite and not some one else who might use it against you pascal shook his head i know how to ensure its safe receipt 
he replied some time ago marguerite told me if ever any great peril threatened us i might call for the housekeeper at the chalus mansion and entrust my message to her the danger is sufficiently great to justify such a course in the present instance so i shall pass down the rue de courcelles ask to see madame leon and give her this letter have no fear my dear mother as he spoke he began to pack all the legal documents which had been confided to him into a large box which was to be carried to one of his former friends who would distribute the papers among the people they belonged to he next made a small bundle of the few important private papers and valuables he possessed and then ready for the sacrifice he took a last survey of the pleasant home where success had smiled so favourably upon his efforts where he had been so happy and where he had cherished such bright dreams of the future overcome by the flood of recollections the tears sprang to his eyes he embraced his mother and fled precipitately from the house poor child murmured madame ferrailleur poor pascal was she not also to be pitied this was the second time within twenty years that a thunderbolt had fallen on her in the full sunlight of happiness and yet now as on the day following her husband's death she found in her heart the robust energy and heroic maternal constancy which enable one to rise above every misfortune it was in a firm voice that she ordered her servant to go in search of the nearest furniture dealer no matter which provided he would pay cash and when the man arrived she showed him through the rooms with stoical calmness god alone knew how intensely she was suffering and yet while she was waiting for the dealer each piece of furniture had acquired an extraordinary value in her eyes it seemed to her as if each object were a part of herself and when the man turned and twisted a chair or a table she almost considered it a personal affront the rich who are accustomed from birth to the luxury that surrounds them are ignorant of the terrible sufferings which attend such cases as these the persons who do suffer are those of the middle classes not the parvenus but those who bid fair to become parvenus when misfortune overtook them their hearts bleed when inexorable necessity deprives them of all the little comforts with which they had gradually surrounded themselves for there is not an object that does not recall a long ungratified desire and the almost infantile joy of possession what happiness they felt on the day when they purchased that large armchair how many times they had gone to admire those velvet curtains in the shop windows before buying them those carpets represented months of self-denial and that pretty clock ah they had fancied it would only herald the flight of prosperous and pleasant hours and all these things the dealer handles and shakes and jeers at and depreciates he will scarcely condescend to purchase who would care to buy such trash he knows that the owner is in need of money and he profits by this knowledge it is his business how much did this cost you he asks as he inspects one piece of furniture after another so much well you must have been terribly cheated you know very well that if there is a cheat in the world it is this same man but what can you say any other dealer you might send for would act in the same way now madame ferrailleur's furniture had cost some ten thousand francs and although it was no longer new it was worth at least a third of that sum but she obtained only seven hundred and sixty francs for it it is true however that she was in haste and that she was paid cash nine o'clock was striking when her trunks were at last piled on a cab and she called out to the driver take me to the place du havre to the railway station once before when defrauded by a scoundrel she had been obliged to part with all her household treasures once before she had left her home taking merely the wreck of her fortune with her but what a difference between then and now then the esteem and sympathy of all who knew her was hers and the admiring praise she received divested the sacrifice of much of its bitterness and increased her courage twofold now she was flying secretly and alone under an assumed name trembling at the thought of pursuit or recognition flying as a criminal flies at the thought of his crime and fear of punishment she had far less suffered on the day when with her son upon her knees she journeyed to the cemetery following all that was mortal of the man who had been her only thought her love her pride 
her happiness and hope though crushed by the sense of her irreparable loss she had not rebelled against the hand that struck her but now it was human wickedness that assailed her through her son and her suffering was like that of the innocent man who perishes for want of power to prove his innocence her husband's death had not caused her such bitter tears as her son's dishonour she who was so proud and who had such good reason to be proud she could note the glances of scorn she was favoured with as she left her home she heard the insulting remarks made by some of her neighbours who like so many folks found their chief delight in other people's misfortunes crocodile tears some had exclaimed she is going to meet her son and with what he has stolen they will live like princes in america rumour which enlarges and misrepresents everything had indeed absurdly exaggerated the affair at madame d'argelet's house it was reported in the rue d'ulme that pascal had spent every night at the gaming-table for more than five years and that being an incomparable trickster he had stolen millions meanwhile madame ferrailleur was approaching the station the cab-horse soon slackened its pace to climb the acclivity of the rue d'amsterdam and shortly afterward the vehicle drew up in the courtyard of the railway station faithfully observing the directions which had been given her the worthy woman had her trunks taken to the baggage-room declaring that she should not leave paris until the next day whereupon she received a receipt from the man in charge of the room she was oppressed by vague apprehensions and looked closely at every one who passed her fearing the presence of spies and knowing full well that the most profound secrecy could alone ensure the success of pascal's plans however she did not see a single suspicious-looking person some englishmen those strange travellers who are at the same time so foolishly prodigal and so ridiculously miserly were making a great hue and cry over the four sous gratuity claimed by a poor commissionaire but these were the only persons in sight partially reassured madame ferrailleur hastily ascended the staircase and entered the large waiting-room it was here that pascal had promised to meet her but though she looked round on all sides she did not perceive him still this delay did not alarm her much nor was it at all strange since pascal had scarcely known what he would have to do when he left the house she seated herself on a bench as far back in the shade as possible and gazed sadly at the ever-changing throng when all of a sudden she was startled by a man who abruptly paused in front of her this man proved to be pascal but his hair had been closely cut and he had shaved off his beard and thus shorn with his smooth face and with a brown silk neckerchief in lieu of the white muslin tie he usually wore he was so greatly changed that for an instant his own mother did not recognize him well asked madame ferrailleur as she realized his identity i have succeeded we have secured such rooms as i wished for where ah a long way off my poor mother many a league from those we have known and loved in a thinly populated part of the suburbs on the route de la revolte just outside the fortifications and almost at the point where it intersects the asnières road you will not be very comfortable there but you will have the pleasure of a little garden she rose summoning all her energy what does it matter where or what our abode is she interrupted with forced gaiety i am confident that we shall not remain there long but it seemed as if her son did not share her hopes for he remained silent and dejected and as his mother observed him closely she fancied by the expression of his eyes that some new anxiety had been added to all his other troubles what is the matter she inquired unable to master her alarm what has happened ah a great misfortune my god still another i have been to the rue de courcelles and i have spoken to madame leon what did she say the count de chalus died this morning madame ferrailleur drew a long breath as if greatly relieved she was certainly expecting to hear something very different and she did not understand why this death should be a great misfortune to them personally one point however she did realize that it was imprudent and even dangerous to carry on this conversation in a hall where a hundred persons were passing and repassing every minute so she took her son's arm and led him away saying come let us go 
pascal had kept the cab which he had been using during the afternoon and having installed his mother inside he got in himself and gave his new address to the driver now tell me all said madame ferrailleur poor pascal was in that state of mind in which it costs one actual suffering to talk but he wished to mitigate his mother's anxiety as much as possible and moreover he did not like her to suppose him wanting in endurance so with a powerful effort he shook off the lethargy that was creeping over him and in a voice loud enough to be heard above the noise of the carriage wheels he began this is what i have done mother since i left you i remembered that some time ago while i was appraising some property i had seen three or four houses on the route de la revolte admirably suited to our present wants naturally i went there first a suite of rooms was vacant in one of these houses i have taken it and in order that nothing may interfere with the liberty of my movements i have paid six months rent in advance here is the receipt drawn up in the name we shall henceforth bear so saying he showed his mother a document in which the landlord declared that he had received from m montmejean the sum of three hundred and fifty francs for two quarters rent etc my bargain concluded he resumed i returned into paris and entered the first furniture shop i saw i meant to hire the necessary things to furnish our little home but the dealer made all sorts of objections he trembled for his furniture he wanted a sum of money to be deposited as security or the guarantee of three responsible business men seeing this and knowing that i had no time to lose i preferred to purchase such articles as were absolutely necessary one of the conditions of the purchase was that everything should be in the house and in its place by eleven o'clock to-night as i stipulated in writing that the dealer should forfeit three hundred francs in case he failed to fulfil his agreement i can rely upon his punctuality i confided the key of our lodgings to him and he must now be there waiting for us so before thinking of his love and mademoiselle marguerite pascal had taken the necessary measures for the execution of his plan to regain his lost honour madame ferrailleur had scarcely supposed him capable of so much courage and firmness and she rewarded him with a warm pressure of the hand then as he was silent when did you see madame leon then she asked when all the household arrangements were completed mother on leaving the furniture shop i found that i still had an hour and a quarter before me i could defer no longer and at the risk of obliging you to wait for me i hastened to the rue de courcelles it was evident that pascal felt extreme embarrassment in speaking of mademoiselle marguerite there is an instinctive delicacy and a dislike of publicity in all deep passion and true and chaste love is ever averse to laying aside the veil with which it conceals itself from the inquisitive madame ferrailleur understood this feeling but she was a mother and as such jealous of her son's tenderness and anxious for particulars concerning this rival who had suddenly usurped her place in the heart where she had long reigned supreme she was also a woman that is to say distrustful and suspicious in reference to all other women so without taking pity on pascal's embarrassment she urged him to continue i gave the driver five francs on condition that he would hurry his horses he resumed and we were rattling along at a rapid rate when suddenly near the hotel de chalus i noticed a change in the motion of the vehicle i looked out and saw that we were driving over a thick layer of straw which had been spread across the street i can scarcely describe my feelings on seeing this a cold perspiration came over me i fancied i saw marguerite in agony dying far from me and calling me in vain without waiting for the vehicle to stop i sprang to the ground and was obliged to exercise all my self-control to prevent myself from rushing into the concierge's lodge and wildly asking who is dying here but an unforeseen difficulty presented itself it was evident that i ought not to go in person to inquire for madame leon whom could i send there were no commissionnaires at the street corners and nothing could have induced me to confide the message to any of the lads in the neighbourhood wine-shops fortunately my driver the same who is driving us now is an obliging fellow and i entrusted him with the commission while i stood guard over his horses ten minutes later madame leon left the house and came to meet me i knew her at once for i had seen her a hundred times with marguerite when they lived near the luxembourg and having seen me pass and repass so often she recognized me in spite of my changed appearance 
her first words monsieur de chalus is dead relieved my heart of a terrible weight i could breathe again but she was in such haste that she could not stop to tell me any particulars still i gave her my letter and she promised me a prompt reply from marguerite everybody will be up and moving about the house to-night and she said she could easily make her escape for a few moments so at half-past twelve to-night she will be at the little garden gate and if i am promptly at hand i shall have a reply from marguerite madame ferrailleur seemed to be expecting something more and as pascal remained silent she remarked you spoke of a great misfortune in what does it consist i do not perceive it with an almost threatening gesture and in a gloomy voice he answered the misfortune is this if it had not been for this abominable conspiracy which has dishonoured me marguerite would have been my wife before a month had elapsed for now she is free absolutely free to obey the dictates of her own will and heart then why do you complain oh mother don't you understand how can i marry her would it be right for me to think of offering her a dishonoured name it seems to me that i should be guilty of a most contemptible act of something even worse than a crime if i dared to speak to her of my love and our future before i have crushed the villains who have ruined me regret anger and the consciousness of his present powerlessness drew from him tears which fell upon madame ferrer's heart like molten lead but she succeeded in concealing her agony all the more reason she answered almost coldly why you should not lose a second but devote all your energy and intelligence to the work of justification oh i shall have my revenge never fear but in the meantime what is to become of her think mother she is alone in the world without a single friend it is enough to drive one mad she loves you you tell me what have you to fear now she will be freed from the persecutions of the suitor they intended to force upon her whom she has spoken to you about the marquis de valorsay is it not this name sent pascal's blood to his brain ah the scoundrel he exclaimed if there was a god in heaven wretched boy interrupted madame ferrailleur you blaspheme when providence has already interposed on your behalf and who suffers most at this moment do you think you strong in your innocence or the marquis who realizes that he has committed an infamous crime in vain the sudden stopping of the cab put an end to their conversation leaving the route d'asnières the driver had turned into the route de la revolte and had drawn up in front of an unpretentious two-storied house which stood entirely alone we have arrived mother said pascal a man who was standing on the threshold stepped forward to open the cab door it was the furniture dealer here you are at last monsieur montmejean said he come in and you'll see that i've strictly fulfilled the conditions of our contract his words proved true he was paid the sum stipulated and went away satisfied now my dear mother said pascal allow me to do the honours of the poor abode i have selected he had taken only the ground floor of this humble dwelling the story above which had an independent entrance and staircase was occupied by the quiet family of the owner although the space was small the architect had made the most of it he had divided it into four small rooms separated by a corridor and the kitchen looked out upon a little garden about four times as large as an ordinary sheet the furniture which pascal had purchased was more than plain but it was well suited to this humble abode it had just been brought in but any one would have supposed it had been in its place for a couple of years we shall be very comfortable here declared madame ferrailleur yes very comfortable by to-morrow evening you won't recognize the place i have saved a few trifles from the wreck some curtains a couple of lamps a clock you'll see it's wonderful how much four trunks can be made to hold when his mother set him such a noble example pascal would have blushed to allow himself to be outdone he very quietly explained the reasons which had influenced him in choosing these rooms the principal one being that there was no concierge and he was therefore assured absolute liberty in his movements as well as entire immunity from indiscreet gossip certainly my dear mother 
he added it is a lonely and unattractive neighbourhood but you will find all the necessaries of life near at hand the owner of the house lives on the floor above i have talked with the wife they seem to be honest quiet people and she will pilot you about i inquired for some one to do the heavy work and she mentioned a poor woman named ventresson who lives in the neighbourhood and who is anxious to obtain employment they were to inform her this evening and you will see her to-morrow and above all don't forget that you are henceforth madame montmejean occupied with these arrangements for the future he was still talking when madame ferrailleur drawing out her watch gently remarked and your appointment you forget that the cab is waiting at the door it was true he had forgotten it he caught up his hat hastily embraced his mother and sprang into the vehicle the horses were almost exhausted but the driver was so willing that he found a means of making them trot as far as the rue de courcelles however on arriving there he declared that his animals and himself could endure no more and after receiving the amount due to him he departed the air was chilly the night dark and the street deserted the gloomy silence was only disturbed at long intervals by the opening or shutting of a door or by the distant tread of some belated pedestrian having at least twenty minutes to wait pascal sat down on the curbstone opposite the hotel de chalus and fixed his eyes upon the building as if he were striving to penetrate the massive walls and see what was passing within only one window that of the room where the dead man was lying was lighted up and he could vaguely distinguish the motionless form of a woman standing with her forehead pressed against the pane of glass a prey to the indescribable agony which seizes a man when he feels that his life is at stake that his future is about to be irrevocably decided pascal counted the seconds as they passed by he found it impossible to reflect to deliberate to decide on any plan of action he forgot the tortures he had endured during the last twenty-four hours Coralt, Valorcet, Madame d'Argelet, the Baron no longer existed for him. He forgot his loss of honour and position, and the disgrace attached to his name. The past was annihilated, as it were, and he could think of no future beyond the next few moments. His physical condition undoubtedly contributed to his mental weakness. He had taken no food that day, and he was faint from want of nourishment he had come without an overcoat moreover and the cold night air chilled him to the bone there was a strange ringing in his ears and a mist swam before his eyes at last the bell at the beaujon hospital tolled the appointed hour and roused him from his lethargy he seemed to hear a voice crying to him in the darkness up the hour has come trembling and with tottering limbs he dragged himself to the little gate opening in the gardens of the chalus mansion soon it softly opened and madame leon appeared ah it was not she that pascal had hoped to see unfortunate man he had been listening to that mysterious echo of our own desires which we so often mistake for our presentiment and it had whispered in his heart marguerite herself will come with the candour of wretchedness he could not refrain from telling madame leon the hope he had entertained but on hearing him the housekeeper recoiled with a gesture of outraged propriety and reproachfully exclaimed what are you thinking of monsieur what could you suppose that mademoiselle marguerite would abandon her place by her dead father's bedside to come to a rendezvous ah you should think better of her than that the dear child he sighed deeply and in a scarcely audible voice he asked hasn't she even sent me a reply yes monsieur she has and although it is a great indiscretion on my part i bring you the letter here it is now good evening i must go at once what would become of me if the servants discovered my absence and found that i had gone out alone she was hurrying away but pascal detained her pray wait until i see what she has written he said imploringly i shall perhaps be obliged to send her some message in reply madame leon obeyed though with rather bad grace and not without several times repeating make haste while pascal ran to a street lamp near by 
it was not a letter that marguerite had sent him but a short note written on a scrap of crumpled paper folded and not sealed it was written in pencil and the handwriting was irregular and indistinct still by the flickering light of the gas pascal deciphered the word monsieur it made him shudder monsieur what did this mean in writing to him of recent times marguerite had always said my dear pascal or my friend nevertheless he continued i have not had the courage to resist the entreaties made to me by the count de chalus my father in his last agony i have solemnly pledged myself to become the wife of the marquis de valorsay one cannot break a promise made to the dying i shall keep mine even though my heart break i shall do my duty god will give me strength and courage forget her whom you loved she is now the betrothed of another and honour commands her to forget your very name once more and for the last time farewell if you love me you will not try to see me again it would only add to my misery think as though she were dead she who signs herself marguerite the commonplace wording of this letter and the mistakes in spelling that marred it entirely escaped pascal's notice he only understood one thing that marguerite was lost to him and that she was on the point of becoming the wife of the vile scoundrel who had planned the snare which had ruined him at the hotel d'argelet breathless despairing and half crazed with rage he sprang toward madame leon marguerite where is she he demanded in a hoarse unnatural voice i must see her oh monsieur what do you ask is it possible allow me to explain to you but the housekeeper was unable to finish her sentence for pascal had caught her by the hands and holding them in a vice-like grip he repeated i must see marguerite and speak to her i must tell her that she has been deceived i will unmask the scoundrel who the frightened housekeeper struggled with all her might trying her best to reach the little gate which was standing open you hurt me she cried are you mad let me go or i shall call for help and twice indeed she shouted in a loud voice help murder but her cries were lost in the stillness of the night if any one heard them no one came still they recalled pascal to a sense of the situation and he was ashamed of his violence he released madame leon and his manner suddenly became as humble as it had been threatening excuse me he said entreatingly i am suffering so much that i don't know what i'm doing i beseech you to take me to mademoiselle marguerite or else run and beg her to come here i ask but a moment madame leon pretended to be listening attentively but in reality she was quietly manoeuvring to gain the garden gate soon she succeeded in doing so whereupon with marvellous strength and agility she pushed pascal away and sprang inside the garden closing the gate after her and saying as she did so be gone you scoundrel this was the final blow and for more than a minute pascal stood motionless in front of the gate stupefied with mingled rage and sorrow his condition was not unlike that of a man who after falling to the bottom of a precipice is dragging himself up all mangled and bleeding swearing that he will yet save himself when suddenly a heavy stone which he had loosened in his descent falls forward and crushes him all that he had so far endured was nothing in comparison with the thought that valorcet would wed marguerite was such a thing possible would god permit such a monstrous iniquity no that shall never be he muttered i will murder the scoundrel rather and afterward justice may do whatever it likes with me he experienced that implacable merciless thirsting for vengeance which does not even recoil before the commission of a crime to secure satisfaction and this longing inflamed him with such energy that although he had been so utterly exhausted a few moments before he was not half an hour in making his way back to his new home his mother who was waiting for him with an anxious heart was surprised by the flush on his cheeks and the light glittering in his eyes ah you bring good news she exclaimed his only answer was to hand her the letter which madame leon had given him saying as he did so read 
madame ferrailleur's eyes fell upon the words once more and for the last time farewell she understood everything turned very pale and in a trembling voice exclaimed don't grieve my son the girl did not love you oh mother if you knew but she checked him with a gesture and lifting her head proudly she said i know what it is to love pascal it is to have perfect faith if the whole world had accused your father of a crime would a single doubt of his innocence have ever entered my mind this girl has doubted you they have told her that you cheated at cards and she has believed it you have failed to see that this oath at the bedside of the dying count is only an excuse it was true the thought had not occurred to pascal my god he cried in agony are you the only one who believes in my innocence without proofs yes it must be your task to obtain these proofs and i shall obtain them he rejoined in a tone of determination i am strong now that i have marguerite's life to defend for they have deceived her mother or she would never have given me up oh don't shake your head i love her and so i trust her End of chapter 16